به برنامه نان گل سر خوش اومدید سلام به همگی من مریم نمازی هم و من فریبرز پویا هستم در برنامه این هفته در رابطه با عادت ماهانه زنان میخوایم با تون صحبت کنیم به خصوص چون هشت مارس روز جهانی زن به زودی داره فرا میرسه و یه فیلم کوتاهی مستندی که اخیرا اسکار رو برده کارگردانش هم یک زن ایرانیه و این فیلم خیلی جالبه که در رابطه با چیه عادت زنان مصابه این هفته در رابطه با فتوا علیه سلمان رشدی سی سال بعد از اعلام این فتوا با چند زن که در این مورد حرفای زیاد دارن بزنن مصابه پاما باشی در اسکار امسال یک فیلم کوتاه مستند که جایزه اسکار و برد یک فیلمی در رابطه با عادت زنان و وقتی که کارگردانش که ایرانی اومد روی صحنه که جایزه رو بهش بدن داشت گریه میکرد و میگفت گریه نمیکنم به خاطر اینکه عادت ماهانمه ولی گریه میکنم به خاطر اینکه یک فیلم در رابطه با عادت زنان اسکار برده و واقعا به نظرم این یه چیز تاریخیه دقیقا توی قرن 21 در این مورد جامعه مجبور صحبت بکنه و فیلم در رابطه با زندگی یک سری زناس توی یکی از مناطق هند که با مشکلاتی رو که زنا دارن زبانشون چطوری در این مورد صحبت میکنن و دارن سعی میکنن که این تابوی قضیه رو بشکنن و بیشتر در مورد صحبت کنن این قضیه تنها در هندی است در کشورهای مختلف هم همین از یه قضیه وجود داره وقتی نگاه میکنیم و دقیقا و خب میبینیم در کشورهای مختلف وجود داره و در زم در مذاهب مختلف مثلا خب توی هند این مذهب هندو برای مثال میگه که زنی که عادتشه نباید حتی توی آشپزخونه بره نباید دست بزنه به هیچ مردی یا هیچ کس دیگه چون کثیف هستش و این اینو تو مذاهب دیگه هم میبینیم توی بعضی از قشرای بودایی میبینیم توی یهودیت میبینیم توی مسیحیت حتی میبینیم و در اسلام هم خیلی واضح است برای مثال زنی که عادتشه نمیتونه نماز بخونه نمیتونه برای بر مثال بره توی مسجد و, و این نگاه به زن که کسیف میدونین یه چیزی تا... که نباید بهش دست اعتباد نباید باش داشت, باش داشت, داشت دقیقا. وقتی دقیقا. که این, این عادتش رو داره که البته یه چیز خیلی طبیعیه دقیقا شما نگاه کنید این توی تاریخ وجود داشته و هنوز این هنوز ادامه داره همین برای رایگیری برای این فیلم عادت ماهانه که اسکار بورد یکی از کسایی که رای قرار بوده رای گفته من رای نمیدم به این به خاطر اینکه این مسئله ای که زنان در مورد حرف میزنن میکنن و این یه چیز خیلی نجسی من در موردش نمیخوام صحبت کنم و این نجس بودن و کسی بودن ناپاک بودن تو زبان در واقع خودشو بیان میکنه و نشون میده و تو کشورهای مختلفی نگاه میکنین هنوز که هنوز ترد میشن زنا به, شکل به اشکال مختلف شما توجه کنین تحصیل روی بچه که داره بزرگ میشه هم دختر هم پسر پسری که بزرگ میشه نه خبر داره نه میدونه چیه نه احساسش رو درد میکنه و چقدر فشار میاری دختر خود یفه خودش مجبور کنه همه تردش میکنن و در واقع بیشتر هم دمارش نمیدونن هیچ کس بشون توضیح نمیده دقیقا چیه آره منم یادم وقتی من عادت ماهانم رو گرفتم 11 سالم بود و نمیدونستم چه اتفاقی افتاده چون توی مدارسم اون موقع هم تو ایران درس نمیدادن و بی خبر بودیم و توی خود اروپا هم یه جنگ روی این مسئله که این چیزا درس داده بشه تابو هنوز وجود داره روی مسائلی که مربوط به بدن زن و دختر به خصوص و این صحبت شما این که آدم ترد میشن واقعا جدیه یعنی واقعا یک بحث مرگ و زندگی برای خیلی هم. توی اخبار برای مثال اخیرا توی نپال چندین زن مردن به خاطر اینکه وقتی که عادت ماها نشونه باید برن توی یک کابینایی بمونن و مثلا توی زمستون آتیش باید بسوسونن اون تو و خفه شدن بچه هاشون هم باید باهاشون باشن مثلا اگر بچه شیرخاره باید با مادرش بره تو اون از این کابینا و بچه ها و مادر همه میمیرن و خیلی از این اتفاقات میفته توی نپال توی هندوستان خوندم اخیرا یه دختر دوازده سال خودکشی کرد به خاطر اینکه توی مدرسه عادتش اومده بود و 
شلوارش خون داشت روش و معلمش بیرونش کرد از کلاس و یه جوری یه کاری کرد که احساس شرم کنه دختره این شرم و ناپاک بودن یکی از در واقع فرهنگی که تو همه جوامع وجود داره زنان رو ترد میکنن و با این باید مبارزه کرد به خاطر اینکه طبیعی ترین وضعیت انسان رو که در واقع پیریت رابطه مستقیم با به وجود بردن انسان به قدرت بدن زنان نشون میده به جایی که یه چیز نص مثبتی باشه و یه چیز طبیعی باشه که در بردش همه بتونن حرف بزنن صحبت بکنن و طبیعی باشه به یه موضوع کنترل ترد شدن و دوباره به علیه زنان استفاده میشه و الان مبارزه به علیه این و در واقع شکوندن این تابو هم در واقع توی کشورهای مختلف شروع شده و در مورد شدن هر تون در ایران هست این قضیه و مهم روی این قضیه بیشتر تحکید کرد و دقیقا این, این تابو رو باید شکست یعنی وقتی که فکر میکنیم که این یک مسئله واقعا مرگ و زندگیه برای خیلی دختران و زنان و مهمه که این تابوی که کسیف نجس پاک نیست اینا رو همه رو باید شکون و این به من یه چیز خیلی طبیعی دید و به همین خاطرم برای این هشت مارس من و سادیا حمید یک عمل اعتراضی در دفاع از عادت ماهانه زنان و علیه قوانین و دولت هایی که و, و مذاهبی که اینو تابو میبینن و اینو کثیف میبینن این یه اعتراضی انجام دادیم و به نظر من این یه چیزی که باید سراسری بشه و این عکس عملی که باید نشون بدیم علیه چیزایی که واقعا عمیقا ضد زنن ضد دخترن ضد انسانی و بچرین عادت زن یه چیز کاملا طبیعی است به هیچ وجه تابو نباید باشه و این تابو رو حداقل باید بتونیم توی قرن 21 بش کنیم دقیقا این وظیفه همه آدم های تو جامعه است هم مرد هم زن که در این مورد صحبت بکنن به اشتراک بذارن در موردش حرف بزنن و زبایی های مختلفش رو باید مقابله کنن با زبانی که زن رو تعد میکنه انسان از خودش بیگانه میکنه مرد به عنوان یک حیوان به حیوان تبدیل میکنه با این زبان با این بیان و با این اشکال مختلف حمله به زن که به انسانیت جامعه است در واقع باش مقابله بکنن و پیروز باشیم برای این کاری که داریم میکنیم به سوی 8 مارس موفق امسال و به سوی اتمام تبو علیه عادت زنان و دختران Uh, the Salman Rushdie affair uh, was divided into the heroes and the cowards. Uh, so there were those who understood the principles that were at stake, who didn't uh, have very much understanding of what we all see now, which is the, um, you know, the, the, the inexorable rise of fundamentalism. And so they were quite haughty in their understanding of this ridiculous thing, and they But they were very brave. Uh, so Ian McEwan was very brave. Uh, Blake Morrison was very brave. The publishers uh, were very brave. Former former editors were very brave. But they all knew that they could uh, be killed. Uh, because, of course, the fatwa was not just against Salman. It was against uh, uh, the publishers. So what we did in the, uh, the, our free-floating world that doesn't have reference to anything else is we carried on uh, being there for Salman. So there were any number of literary events at which there would be a mystery guest would turn out to be Salman. So he was very much part of uh, our, our, our literary world continuously. I think we're in, uh, I know we're in a very, very uh, dangerous place now because the, um, the, the rise of um, religious extremism um, is, seems to be unstoppable. And I do feel, um, as a person uh, connected to the network of, uh, of Penn, uh, that, that there's very little understanding in the traditional uh, political institutions and, and the uh, traditional media, the very little understanding of what the real issues are. It's almost as if they're still locked into the tail end of 
uh, the, the Cold War, 1989 uh, uh, to be precise, they haven't figured out how to um, analyze and unravel the, the, the situation that we have now. And it has been very difficult to explain to the younger generation who are coming um, from an unbounded social media background and they're trying to um, um, bound that world. world. But we haven't yet understood how to explain to our younger generation how, uh, how dangerous it is to take the, um, uh, the side of the censors. The fatwa against Rushdie, the burning of satanic verses, had a huge impact uh, and reverberated around the world. As an organization run, uh, for black and minority women, South of Black Sisters, we were totally shaken to the core by the level of animosity, hostility that was being displayed to what was in effect a book, a, a writer's imagination, a writer's literary imagination, a creative piece of writing. So we had newly formed uh, Women Against Fundamentalism because we understood that this was not uh, just about um, defending the, the work of a, one particular writer, but it was about something much more bigger than we had imagined, something that had taken us all by surprise, which was the way in which religion was being used to clamp down on free speech, freedom of expression, um, and freedom of conscience. We were really concerned by what we were seeing was in effect the warning signs of fundamentalism that was on the rise throughout the world. Forming Women Against Fundamentalism, we decided that our first act had to be to defend Salman Rushdie's right to write, the right to dissent. And the reason we did that was because up until that moment, the debate in the media and in the public was only was a binary one. It was either liberal literary people who were coming out in defend of Rushdie's right to write, or it was the um, Muslim fundamentalists who were claiming to speak on behalf of all Muslims, arguing that he had committed blasphemy. What we were concerned about was that there were no progressive voices of activism, of uh, political movements of the left, of feminists, standing up and saying that what was happening to Rushdie was something far more significant than just about the right to be creative. So we decided to demonstrate against a large fundamentalist demonstration that had been organized calling for the death of Salman Rushdie and supporting the fatwa and calling for the banning of the book. Um, we knew that it was going to be a large demonstration because um, a large uh, army of, of people who had been galvanized in a very emotional way, people who had never read the book, had been galvanized in defense of so-called Islam. And, but even when we arrived at Parliament Square where we decided to wait as a group of black and white women, feminists, we were about 40 women and when we waited at Parliament Square we were taken aback by the thousands upon thousands of largely young angry Muslim men led by clerics so-called community leaders with transnational fundamentalist links which was never properly explored by the media who were leading this uh, defense of the religion um, we did not expect the kind of vitriol, the uh, aggressive, violent reaction that we got. We stood there with our placards and slogans um, which said, fear is your weapon, courage is ours, religious leaders don't speak for us, our traditions struggle not submission, our bodies, our minds, we have the right to choose our own destinies. These were some of our slogans. We stood there in peaceful protest to show the world that there wasn't just a binary battle between the literary establishment and fundamentalists, but there were progressives who were standing up for what was right. Um, and we were attacked. 
we our, our banner they lunged for us to break uh, to tear our banner and if it hadn't been for the police ironically that formed a cordon around them and us we probably would have been injured even fate fatally injured the the ironic thing is at the same time that we were protesting against the fanatics um, a group of fascists of the far right had also turned up about I think they were a part of a splinter fascist movement that was also trying to oppose the Muslim demonstration to parade their own kind of fascism and anti-Muslim racism but when they realized that they couldn't face off uh, the huge army that was before them they turned to us because we were the easier target so the irony and the paradox of that moment is that we were both chanting down with fundamentalism and then turning around to the far right and shouting down with racism at one and the same time. For us, that moment has encapsulated and embodied the kind of politics we stand for, which is one that says you have to face many directions at once without prioritizing any struggle against oppression, one form of oppression over another. And that remains our politics now. I think one of the key lessons for us is that we have to really understand and be vigilant to the warning signs. This is not just about some disenfranchised group of people who are deprived, who are struggling for their rights. This is the very opposite. This is about authoritarian movements that want to stamp down on fledgling democratic movements for peace, for tolerance, for rights, for human rights, for universal human rights. This is about clamping down on humanity and progress. So I think people have been slow to understand that warning sign that the right to dissent is the lifeblood of any democracy. And dissenting is so important now than ever when we are faced with worldwide uh, authoritarianism of one kind or another, where journalists, writers, artists, activists, lawyers are being put behind bars or killed for their beliefs, for standing up for what is right, for daring to disagree with the status quo. We seem to have moved and drifted towards the right with our eyes shut. That's what it felt like 30 years ago, was that too many people were turning a blind eye or remaining silent. For what? For what? Because they didn't want to be accused of being racist or Islamophobic. It's made no difference. 30 years later, we have those accusations now more entrenched in the way in which the state deals with minorities, the state deals with religion, facilitates fundamentalism, the way in which the media deals with these issues, where now fundamentalism is now more entrenched than it was, and we are heading in one direction only if we don't stop. As If we call ourselves the progressive left, we really have to do something about this. For me, I did not appreciate 30 years ago that 30 years later we would be struggling in defense of secularism, in defense of human rights, in defense of the idea of that, that there is such a thing as a shared humanity. 30 years ago I knew that we were dealing with something big, but just how big even I or, and my colleagues probably didn't realize. Now more than ever, we are going to have to amplify the voices of those civilians. It's not people like us, but it's the civilians around the world who are brave and courageous enough to stand up against fundamentalism, to refuse to underestimate it, to refuse to see this as just a little blip in world politics. This has now fundamentalism, authoritarianism, the far right, the religious right has mainstreamed itself into societal structures, into the law, into political spaces, into cultural spaces and we now have even more of an uphill task than we did 30 years ago. Well, 
when the Satanic Verses was published, nobody was very interested in questions of religion. Even though the Iranian Revolution and the counter-revolution had taken place 10 years before, it hadn't really percolated into British consciousness. So when we had a meeting and said we want to have this and issued a statement at the end of the meeting, uh, the meeting was on religious fundamentalism, and we, uh, South Hall Black Sisters had it with the lab local women's labor party, and we said we want to have this meeting on religious fundamentalism, they said, okay, but they didn't really know why, you know, why, why are we talking about religion? You know, it's a very strange thing to talk about. And then we issued this statement in support of Rushdi, and it was like a thunderclap. Um, because people didn't understand it. But you know, at that time, there was a progressive anti-racist movement which was very supportive of us. I want to make this point really clearly. We had support from the anti-racist movement. One of the grand men of um, uh, really black liberation uh, called John LaRose, who ran a book fair called The Third World I think Black Radical and Progressive Book Fair, uh, something like that. And it had publishers from all over the world. It had a lot of extremely interesting uh, talks and so on. He made a statement in support of Rushdie. He read South Old Black Sisters' statement. He really put the protective arm of an older brother in the anti-racist movement around us. You know, so it's not true that we were completely vilified. Yes, we had flack. But there was that presence there which we don't see so visible any longer. There were a number of responses because there were, there were people like the uh, first black MP, Bernie Grant, who said, and you'll see it in the film later, uh, said if, if, if Rushdie wants to criticize Muslims, let him go to Saudi Arabia. And he made a lot of absurd statements. Uh, but there were other people who completely understood the issue. And they were from progressive uh, uh, parties. They were from the far left. They were from uh, the uh, Labour Party. Jeremy Corbyn spoke here in Conway Hall, sitting beside me, uh, about, uh, in support of Rushdie. Uh, uh, Tariq Ali, who was um, uh, my producer, you know, he, he ran the channel, uh, Bandung File, the program that the, the films were made for. He was very keen on making anti-fundamentalist films. So there were a lot of very clear thinking, older left people who were very, very clear about this issue. And yes, there was opposition, but that opposition now, this is the point I want to make, it's much worse now than it was 30 years ago. What we call the regressive left or the postmodernist left wasn't as entrenched then as it was now. You saw the beginnings of it, you saw some of those arguments, but they've got so well developed that even with the mass murders like Charlie Hebdo, people are feeling different. Or they feel that Charlie Hebdo cartoonists brought it on themselves. And they, you know, they're, they're indifferent to the attacks on Jews and the supermarket attack. They're indifferent to the fact that there's very clear armed violence aimed at specific groups of people, which include atheists, which include writers and cartoonists, which include Jews, uh, which include all religious minorities. I mean, they're very, very specific groups of people being attacked in very organized ways. And yet it's always seen as, you know, just some oppressed man who got a little bit, you know, too oppressed and suddenly, you know, woke up and attacked people. It's not spontaneous like that. Uh, I mean, the, the ideology is primed to get people to make spontaneous attacks. And that, it wasn't happening at that level at that time. What we were mostly dealing with was racism of the wider community and the sexism also of the wider community and within our own community. So we had two or three fights on our hands and the religious fundamentalism issue was actually added onto that. At that time, the community leaders we were fighting were secular. They were patriarchal, but they were secular, and we were fighting them. But now, many of the community leaders that the government favors are actually fundamentalists. The dissenting movements have grown. The ex-Muslim movement, obviously, that's a huge worldwide movement. There's an understanding of some of these issues. Women's coalitions have grown over this period. I mean, we were already part, I was part of uh, the Women Living Under Muslim Laws Coalition, which was all across the world. So Pakistani women were opposing Islamicization in Pakistan. You will see in the film the Iranian women speaking about what happened in Iran, saying, don't make the mistake of thinking that hijab is liberation. We were saying it at 89. So those understandings were there, and certainly the people who hold to that view the, the networks have grown stronger. Um, so in some ways the, the, the resistance and the understanding is stronger, but the opposition from the liberals is also stronger. The lesson is you must never apologize for blaspheming. Never apologize. 
carry on doing what you need to do. If people can't live with blasphemy, it means that they're part of a violent political movement. It's not just about their oppression. Well, clearly, uh, when uh, the satanic verses uh, fatwa happened against Salman Rushdie, uh, it was an indication of what uh, was going to come in the world. And we're seeing very clearly now that 30 years on, there are many blasphemy laws that didn't exist 30 years ago. And also, it's become very difficult to blaspheme. Uh, even in countries that are secular and where no blasphemy laws exist. Uh, one of the things that Salman Rushdie says is that, uh, you know, what scares uh, those in power of writers is that they're not promoting the official narrative and that scares them because that's the narrative that powers in, that those in power want to be sure are imposed. And so, in a sense, that's what blasphemy is, isn't it? Going against the official narrative and uh, dissenting in a way that brings down the walls and challenges power in a way that is very difficult to do. And that's the importance of Salman Rushdie's work, why the satanic verses need to be defended, why Charlie Hebdo needs to be defended, but also why so many of those who are on apostasy and blasphemy sentences in Iran, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, across the world really need to be defended because defending them is defending fundamental freedom of expression which is everyone's right, religious and non-religious. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.